Pam's my clicker. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, in advance. I'm, I'm not an expert. I want to start off by saying that I'm not an expert. Um, I, I do have kids, but that doesn't make me a parenting expert either. Um, so I think all of you probably know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I don't have a background in this area. I'm not a therapist. Um, but what I do is I do a lot of research that deals with technologies. and. Um, specifically with educational technologies and their good and bad impact on uh, particularly like on K-12 youth um, through Johns Hopkins, the Center for Research and Reform in Education. Um, and so a lot of our work through that center looks at specific technologies that um, usually school districts implement, but sometimes parents as well, um, implement for their young learners. And we try to ascertain whether or not it's effective, and what kinds of impacts it has on learners. So I'm coming from this from an educational background. Um, having said that, uh, I've sort of fallen into this niche of giving these types of talks because there's a clear need from parents, I think, for some direction. And I think more than anything, just for an outlet to be able to talk with other parents about what's appropriate, what should I do, what's right for me. Um, and get some ideas from other people. And I'm just going to be straightforward with you and say that there is no right answer. So we're, you're not going to leave here tonight with an answer for how to parent or raise or what to do. You're going to have some strategies that you can implement, some things you can do at home if you're not already doing them. Based on your survey comments, um, I think there were 19 last I looked, uh, you're all doing wonderful things already. And I think just by virtue of you being here, like that in itself is a major milestone for just recognizing that technology could pose um, some negative effects on your kids, young kids, teenagers, yourselves even, maybe. Um, so Pam, please, thank you. Uh, I'm trying to frame all these talks through this um, lens of Cranesburg's law, which states that technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. And what he meant by that was that all of our technologies are non-neutral, meaning they're not just tools or instruments um, for achieving a desired effect. They actually have biases, um, inequities, uh, they have adverse effects on us, good and bad, but they're not neutral. And I think that's extremely important to remember because a lot of people, when we're talking about smartphones and when you hear people talking about it in the media uh, or what people write about it, they often refer to it as an instrument and just saying, well, it's just, it's just a tool, it's just an instrument, just, it's good and bad, so you know, it doesn't really matter, it cancels each other out, but it, it doesn't actually. It's always going to be non-neutral, just every technology we have and create is non-neutral in many different ways. And so I think that's important that we keep that in mind, that even in times when we're using our technologies for good, there will be some negative adverse effects that come along with that. The question is, do the good effects outweigh the bad effects? And that's what you have to grapple with and ask yourself every time with every technology, whether it's gaming or a smartphone, texting, entertainment, any of it. Um, I think that's important to remember that, that no technology is neutral. Um, I also look at this through four categories. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, social, behavioral, emotional, cognitive. These are kind of the four areas that I feel like smartphones have the greatest impact. Um, so we're going to try and go through each one of these categories, but rather than just like talk at you and, and heave a bunch of research and literature and things and all these things that say all this negative stuff about it. Rather than say that, I'm going to just sort of frame it and then ask you some questions and then have you talk amongst yourselves and in different groups and then we can reconvene and see what we think as a group. As I said, I'm not an expert, I promise you. Um, the first area is social and this is probably the biggest one and this is probably one of your biggest concerns um, for how your kids are socially interactive through their smartphones. Um, according to your survey, it's about almost half and half. 
Again, this was 19 responses. So 58% say that they do have a smartphone, 42 don't. And then according to how you perceive that they spend their time, that's different than how they actually spend their time, but how you perceive them spending their time um, was kind of surprising to me because I would have guessed social media, but um, this isn't a surprise to say that it's texting, calling, reaching out and being social with their friends. Um, I should also say too that that the reason I, I have you do this survey and answer these types of questions is because there is no right answer here. So if there, and there's no shame, right? If you don't have a smartphone or your kids don't have a smartphone, if another parent chooses to give their kids a smartphone, that doesn't make them a bad parent, right? Every family is different, every dynamic is different, and the decisions you make for your family are for your family only. So you maybe talk to people who have extreme strict regulations on smartphone use, and then others might have no restrictions. Um, I think the answer lies somewhere in the middle, right? Um, but regarding the perceived use of their time, texting and calling, this is pretty normal, right? Um, depending on your child's age, if they're a tween or a teenager, um, they want to be socially interactive. And the modern times call for that to be digital. That's just a fact. And I think we have to kind of accept that that's a fact, right? Um, there's a great comic strip that I think kind of sums up this view. Um, from an outsider perspective, if you look at these four kids on a subway train, you could look at that as them being completely antisocial with one another, or you could look at that as them being ultra social with people who just aren't there in that moment, right? Um, I think the way that you interpret that scenario says a lot about your views on technology, right? Because I guarantee it's not a consensus in here. I guarantee that some people would look at that as them being like, Oh, look at these antisocial kids, always have their faces in their screens. And I think other people would look at that as, we don't know what they're, what are they doing? We don't know. They could be reaching out and talking to family members. They could be um, hyper-social in these cases, just not with the people who are right next to them. And we're also making an assumption that they know each other, that they're friends. Maybe they're not. Do we expect for you to sit on a subway train, to sit next to someone and immediately strike, strike, up, strike up a conversation? Um, no, not always, I mean, sometimes, but that's not always the case. So I think that's important to sort of understand that our perceptions of their usage isn't always 100% accurate. There is a concept though called being alone together, and that I think is probably what, if you saw that cartoon and, and you thought, wow, they're being really antisocial, I think you've probably experienced this alone togetherness, which is what MIT researcher Sherry Turkle coined back in the 90s. Um, and this is fairly common to see, particularly within the family unit, right? Um, and I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how I feel about this. Um, again, we don't know what they're doing, right? Mom and dad could be working, responding to emails, doing something important, making a grocery shopping list, pick up order or something. Kids could be doing homework, I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is that when we're alone together, we're actually denying each other our physical presence. And we have to delineate between a digital presence and a physical presence. And it's hard to articulate what the difference is, but you can imagine maybe the difference being something like seeing the Mona Lisa in person and seeing a picture of the Mona Lisa, right? Um, I mean, I've asked my kids if there's a difference there, and they, the two of them have told me that there is no difference, which is scary, I think. But what is the difference? <laughs> what, what is the difference between seeing the Mona Lisa in person and pulling up a Google image of the Mona Lisa and looking at it. It's hmm? huge. So the size? Yes. Well, we can 
pull it up on this projector, and I think it would be bigger on this screen right here than it is. You don't get the same effect. It's not that big? No. So that's a benefit. We, so we could actually benefit from pulling it up here and really looking at the detail and the brush strokes, right? We can see. It's not the same oh. as seeing it in person. I'm sorry. But I guess if you, it's just at home. It's more than a visual tip right here. When you're thinking about being a little, you have like so many more senses than just visual. That's what you have. somewhat of that pro pro um, progress without fully sacrificing the real thing. So the Mona Lisa analogy is, is fine. I think we would mostly agree that it's, it's not the same thing and that probably seeing it in person is better, if you want to say better or worse. But we can then apply that to communication. Like, what's the difference between saying something to mom and dad via text versus saying it to them in person. I think that depends a lot on what is being said, right? Um, so Sherry Turkle has written several books on this, and, and they're all fantastic, I highly recommend it. Um, but she actually differentiates between communication and conversation. And she says, look, our digital tools are fine, for communicating. They're fine for saying, I'm, I'll be home in 10 minutes, or can you pick this up for me, or just, you know, hey, have a good day. It's fine. That's communication. What they're not good at doing is substituting real conversation. And the danger there is that we allow our brief sips of communications with each other to stand in for longer, deeper conversations with and you might see this in your own lives with maybe older friends or something where maybe you're just maintaining a text uh, relationship with this person now. It's like you check in every once in a while on text. But you're not getting those long conversations, phone conversations, or even in-person conversations that maybe you would have otherwise if you weren't constantly checking in through communication. And I think this is the danger. It's not understanding when you're communicating with someone and when you need to converse with someone. And that's especially important, or important when raising you know, kids. Um, the biggest concern from that social category that I have, and, and I don't want to spend the whole, I mean, we could spend a whole entire night talking about social media, but um, my biggest concern is the social comparison features of social media, particularly as they pertain to young people. Girl and young That's, in my mind, the biggest threat. Um, I, I've, done the, I've done research on um, smartphone usage for males and females, and the differences are very stark between how young men and young women are using their devices. Um, not to say that one is better than the other, but young women are turning to these devices, and particularly um, Instagram and Snap, and, um, TikTok for social validity. And that's a really dangerous phenomenon that Instagram itself um, has acknowledged knowing for some years now. In fact, this um, sort of whistleblowing article came out in 2021 where they uncovered some documents internally at Instagram that showed that they knew that it was impacting young teen girls negatively, and instead of trying to correct that, they capitalized on that and doubled down on some of the different features that 
would help maintain their attention, um, and they sort of tweak different algorithms to really exploit this. So some of the documents said, quote, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. And the perfect image, feeling attractive and having enough money are the most likely to have started on Instagram. So I, I think it's important to like to state that jealousy <coughs> and social comparison, and body shaming, and all these things didn't start with the smartphone. It's always been here. But the smartphone amplifies those things um, to a dangerous level. And so I think that's really important to recognize. I think you probably all recognize that to some degree, otherwise you wouldn't be here because it is a driving concern for a lot of parents. How do I regulate this? What do we do about these different threats that are coming from these technologies that live in my kid's pocket at all times? Um, so I want to maybe let you talk about this. So I want you to talk to the people at your own table about these different things. These are just some questions. You don't have to answer all three. You can stick on one if you want. But the alone together concept, whether the phone hinders or facilitates sociability, and then how we might be able to mitigate the effects of social media use. So go ahead and talk about that, and then we'll come back and talk. Um, <laughs>
Um, so I think what's fascinating though to me is that we are actually gratified by our devices. Not just from like comments on social media or these really tangible things that we see on our devices, but just by physically having it on our person, right? There's actually a ton of research done, it's called mere presence of smartphones, a ton of research done on the mere presence on how a smartphone makes you feel just by having it nearby. And they've done plenty of studies on this where they've had separate rooms for people who um, are asked to leave their phone in one room and go into another room. And they rate things like levels of anxiety, um, or you would maybe call it FOMO or things like that. Um, but then there's actual physical effects that come along with that, like raised heart rate, blood pressure, um, all sorts of different things that come along with being separated from your phones. Um, I did this in my class one time without telling the students beforehand. When they came into the classroom, they had to leave their phones up on a desk um, and then go back and sit down. And they did it. I mean, they didn't fight me on that, but they did it. Um, and because they didn't like, they didn't all put their phones on silent or anything, throughout the whole hour long class, you would hear like notifications and dings, and you just, they just like sit up and they just be, oh. <laughs> I mean, just, you could like, the anxiety was palpable. You could just see it. But we also had them um, on little devices in the classroom throughout the entire class raise their levels of anxiety. And about halfway through the class, their anxiety levels were off the charts, just skyrocketing. They came back down towards the end just because they knew like class is over in seven minutes, so we're getting our phones back. But towards the middle, where they just knew we're not getting our phones back, I mean, there was some serious um, issues that, that they were noting. So I took that information and started to wonder about what it was, what our devices were saying about us. Like, how we use our devices might be more of a mirror or a look into who we are rather than what the device is doing to us. So I thought that it would be like a really narcissistic thing, um, and I'm basing this on like students who you try to talk to them and they're like facing their phones and they're not listening. I'm like, wow, that's, you know, I'm trying to talk to you and you're just like not listening. I'm trying to help you out. You know? I thought that might be like really narcissistic. Like, Man, you're so engrossed in this world that you're in. So we did this, this study um, that looked at narcissism and gave all the students the NPI, which rates their level of narcissism and actually gives them a score on how narcissistic they are. They didn't, they didn't know they were taking that test. They just took a test. Um, and it gives you a score. Um, and firstly, so many of the students just were ranked. Their scores were just obscenely high to begin with. Like, I don't, I don't know, but they were already high. Um, so what we did is we took that information and then we tracked their smartphone usage for a, a period of time and we wanted to know what their usage was, what they were doing on their phones, and, and tried to correlate that to their narcissism levels. Thinking, oh man, if you're a narcissist, you're probably on your phone all the time. Like you're, you're constantly on And it, it actually came back negatively or inversely correlated. It was negatively related to each other, meaning the most narcissistic people were never on their phones. The least narcissistic were on their phones all of the time. And we were like, why, why is that? How could that possibly be? And we kind of realized that like, if you're a, a true narcissist, you don't, you're not looking at other people's things. You want people to be looking at your things. You want people to be in the moment talking to you. Um, listening to you, like you're like me right now, it makes me a narcissist, <laughs> but that's a narcissist. So it completely blew up this idea, but then we measured a whole bunch of other things in that study and found that their usage time was positively, I'm sorry, negatively related to their GPA, their academic GPA. So in other words, the more they were on their phone, the lower their GPA. Um, there was a positive relationship between checks and exhibitionism which meant they were publicly checking their phones to convey a message to other people around them. And typically this was girls more so than boys, but they were checking their phones, and we found this out later through the exit interviews, but um, they were checking their phones to send messages to people around them. Not to do anything on the phone, 
but to make sure people around them knew they were on their phone, they were busy, or they were coveted in some way, or they were extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and they were using it as a way to communicate to people around them, either look at me, I'm important, or don't try to talk to me, I'm, do I'm doing something, you know? And then we followed this up by asking them about um, AirPods and different things like that. And the vast majority of them admitted that uh, if you go on a college campus now and watch like between classes, walking across campus, 90% of those students will have AirPods in, like walking on campus. Um, and we asked them about that and the vast, like 90 something percent, the vast majority admitted that most of the time they're not listening to anything. Yeah. It's not a long commute between building. I mean, it might be three minutes or something. I don't know. So, like, what are you doing in that time? You get out of class, you put your AirPods in, you start walking down campus. What are you listening to? Nothing. You just don't want to talk to other people or have people talk to you. And that, I think, was really shocking to me, even though I've also done that. But I didn't realize how often, <laughs> how often they do it. Um, so that was really, really eye -opening. So then we started trying to relate this to the research on addiction. And this, a, a large part of the book that I wrote focused on um, the medical addiction. So um, I worked with uh, Judson Brewer, who is at, at the time was at Brown University. He's written several books on uh, habit breaking. His research deals with cigarette smoking and breaking um, that habit. But he's an addiction specialist. And you often hear this term about smartphone addiction. But that's actually kind of medically inaccurate to describe it as an addiction. Because an addiction, as he would put it, is use in the face of consequence. So I guess in some ways, when we use our phones, we know that there could be a consequence. Like if you are texting and driving. We're aware that texting and driving might result in an accident. But sometimes we do it anyways. That could be an addictive behavior, but for the most part, you're not doing, you're not exhibiting addiction when you're on your phones, and your kids aren't exhibiting an addiction. They're more likely exhibiting a compulsion, and compulsion is driven by fear. So, what is the fear that shows up in smartphone usage? And it really is this anxiety or fear that they're missing something, and that something could be something with a friend group, socially, but it also could be the score of the game, you know, the March Madness game, or some other maybe news post, or for us it might be a work-related email or something. Like, there's a fear associated with our device checking and usage, and compulsion can really ultimately lead to an addiction, but it's actually pretty rare to be addicted physically, medically, to your devices. Um, my daughter is 14, this is, I guess she was seven or eight, probably seven here. Um, she's been coming into my classes at the end of the semester for like, I guess, eight years now, um, to deliver like her thoughts on smartphones. Like, I wanted her to come in and talk to these students because the whole, this whole entire class, um, they do this smartphone mindfulness thing throughout the entire semester where they're tracking their usage and they're journaling and they're basically talking about how their phone makes them feel and they're supposed to arrive at this big epiphany at the end of the semester. Some of them do and some of them don't. But she comes at the end of the semester and talks about how she perceives other people because she doesn't have a phone um, and what that looks like through her eyes. And her, the reason she keeps coming back and doing this, I ask her to do it, but I don't tell her what to say. Um, the things that she's saying, these 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 year olds are also saying in these journals, when they're writing, when they're talking, they're saying things like, technology makes me feel isolated, or I feel um, less empowered when people around me are on their devices. Um, or I feel less important when I look at other people on social media and I see that I'm not the same or I don't have as much or my value is lessened or whatever it might be. She talks about feeling left out um, or spending time around her friends who are on their devices or sometimes us, sometimes me and my wife being on our phones and her just attention seeking, saying, talk to me, I'm here, look at me, right? Um, 
there's actually a fascinating study that came out in, I think, 2010, when um, I think it was a 3G network, when one of the faster networks was rolled out. So right around when like smartphones started to get like fast, you know, because there was a time there when they were like, yeah, they work, but they weren't great. But then with the rollout of a new network, they became really fast, and you could really use them virtually anywhere. Like there weren't really dead spots and things like that. They did a study of um, physical injuries that had occurred at public parks and overlaid that on the rollout map of these 3G networks and found that they were almost identical. And you can't necessarily say they were caused, but there's definitely a relationship between when parents were taking their kids to parks and they were watching their kids, and now parents take their kids to parks and they sit on their phones. And what they found was that the kids then responded by doing attention-seeking behaviors and more dangerous behaviors because they were trying more and more and more to get their parents' attention. So they were actually engaging in more dangerous behaviors because their parents weren't paying as close attention to them. Um, I thought that was interesting. But I want you to like really reflect on your habits. So where I'm going with this right now is like, we're here to talk about our kids, and we're here to figure out what to do about our kids. But I think the most important thing is that we model the behaviors that we want our kids to do. And I think it's really important for us to reflect on our own habits, on what we do. Because it's really hard for us to say, you can't have a phone, or get off your phone, or this, and then we come over here and get on our phone. It's not as effective. So I think we have to start by saying, what do we do? Um, what are our habits? Do you feel sometimes that you're trapped by those habits? And how can we break our own dependence from these phones? Like, what can we do? Not our kids, but what can we do? So go ahead and talk about those things for, let's say, five minutes. <coughs> It depends on what's going on. Between one of the front ones, like, like right now. Yeah. 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 Ye
have to be involved in it. technology, unfortunately, makes it
does sort of. Yeah, I don't Smartphones, particularly 
on young girls, tweens, age 10 to 13, um, giving them access to, or I should say, unfettered access to social media can have really devastating effects on them, whether it's through um, just perceived sense of self or um, even teen suicide. So, yeah. comes down to how they use their devices. So boys typically use the devices for information seeking and cognitive things, but that also includes like gaming. Um, so they're looking at uh, content. Girls are looking at other girls and valuing themselves. So you can imagine if all you're doing all day long is comparing yourself to someone else, um, that that can really start to have an effect on it's not to say that it doesn't have a mental health effect on boys, it's just, it's much more prominent on young girls than it is on young boys. So do you have advice for people who have both boys and girls and how to be like there if I mean, each kid's so different? Like how? You can probably you see different? the differences. Like yeah. you can see, yeah, yeah I, have, I have two boys and two girls and like they use the, they when they're allowed to get on the um, iPad and things, they use them very differently. Very differently. My 14-year-old would love to just get on social media and go wild, like not, you know, just like look at everything. But like, you know, we really try to regulate that. And I was talking to that table back there about um, allowing her access and allowing her to look at different things and experience social media rather than make it completely taboo and say like, don't you ever look at this app, Instagram, you know? That just is going to make her want to do it. So I think letting her have little bites of, uh, or sips of this interaction with these different things and then talking about it and saying, how do I think I can feel? Or, you know, <laughs> um, what, what do you think about that person's choice about posting that picture? You know what I mean? Like um, having those conversations with them as opposed to just letting them just scroll, 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 and then move on with their lives. Can I add to that? Yeah. Like that's we were having that conversation because what I do with Tess, because her friends have Insta and she'll pick up my phone. Can I just look at so and so's page? And I'm like, well, she was like, I missed the dance and I want to see if they posted anything. And I was like, but you weren't able to make it. You think it's going to make you feel good that you, you know, when you see these pictures, or is it going to make your heart sad? And she's like, well, I just want to see. And sure enough, all these pictures, and she's like, they didn't even mention that they missed me or anything. Aww. And I'm like, where's Cooper? Because they knew she didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't see it. They knew that she wouldn't see it because she doesn't have Instagram. And so, and, and so that's what I said. I said, I feel like if we can just communicate more, and if you even set your kids down who both want to maybe have this thing, and one's a boy and one's a girl, and say, listen, these are the statistics. This is the science behind why my heart and my head don't want you to have these things, because this is how it affects you compared to maybe how it affects your brother, or I don't know, like I feel like if I am such an over communicator sometimes to where sometimes I kind of like, I need to reel it in, like shut up, Jesse, you're saying too much. But I do feel like it helps, especially in our relationship with Tess, because she's the only one who cares. Cooper, it's his gaming, you know, his switch that is our issue. But um, I don't know, I just feel like there's just different things out there that as parents are great tools. I was telling him like the wait till eight thing is a really great, just Google it. It's an amazing resource for parents. Um, and just talking to them about like, I, I don't feel like it's healthy for you and this time either, so sorry. And with the wait till eight thing, I will say too, that's a, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for that program, which is just wait till eighth grade to get your kid a smartphone. Our rule in our house is 16, but I think 15, 14 um, is perfectly acceptable, I think, in that case. Um, that website is wonderful, but it's also set up so that you can implement that at your kid's school. So if your kids go to the same school, you can bring this to the administration and say, we want to do this, and it's meant to go into the school curriculum, and it sets up a um, coalition of parents. And so you can't necessarily see identities, but you can see yeah. uh, how many parents are signed up for this at your school and you can sort of lean on each other and use that as a way, they, they mean it as like an incentive to um, sort of, not I don't want to say parent shame, but like once you're in a group of other parents who you're all on the same page, it's harder then for you to leave that group and be like, oh, you know what, we got our kid a smartphone. You know? <laughs> so it's actually kind of working on the parents as well. So Wait Till Eighth is a fantastic program to do and it's free. You can just and they uh, sign like a pledge 
I guess I've just kind of dabbled. I, I just watched a couple videos and was able to show my kids a video because what it does is kind of shows you different scenarios with a smartphone, without a smartphone, and how like back in our day, you know, back in the old time, <laughs> you know, you would trip in the lunchroom and fall and get spilled pudding all over your face and everybody laughed at you and pointed and a couple weeks later everybody forgot about it. Well, in this day and age, somebody catches it on video and it blasts all over their stuff and then it com they tear you down, they break you down. They it, So it's, like I said, extreme cases, but it's kind of just the reality of, you know, how our life could be better as kids without a smartphone or without access to social media. So, what's the rationale for eighth grade? What's, Just what's magic about eighth grade? Co cognitively developed, like at that point, you're not fully developed, but you're. They actually kind of. Um, they give a lot. That's why I say like I'm okay with eighth grade. I think that's fine. I personally at the 16 year old stage, you could even go farther than that. But I think at a certain point, it becomes almost, almost reckless to kind of keep your kid out of that because the, the reality is like eventually they do need to have digital literacy when it comes to school and high school college workforce like you have to be familiar you can't be 25 years old and be like what's this instagram thing? right never heard right. Of this. Like, it's, you know, so there's probably a range where you you do have to start to introduce it by by force almost um you're forced into I think it's around 16, they say 14. I wouldn't go younger than 14. But like I said, every child is different, every family is different. Is there a suggested alternative for communication? Yeah, I can get to this. Pam, hey, if you want to get oh, to this. Sorry. No, it's fine, because we are, I don't want to run over time too much. But Pam, hey, you can skip. Real quick, let's. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I can talk all night, but I don't want to do that too much. There's so, there's so many. Like so many tentacles to this stuff, so many tentacles that we can branch off sure. on all of these. But I think another thing, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's a whole other can of worms, but like um, the relationships with our phones and with our significant others, I think is a really fascinating area of research. It's actually something called P fubbing, partner fubbing. Um, a fub is when you uh, phone snub your, par your uh, spouse, your partner. Um, which basically is you sort of doing that thing where it's just like you're doing something like, what? oh yeah, no, I'm totally listening, yep. Um, or uh, try to multitask and, and listen to your partner at the same time. It's called partner bubbing. Anyways, they've done lots of studies on that. Not surprisingly, um, realize that the more time you spend on your devices around a significant other, the um, lower confidence levels there are in that um, personal relationship with that person. There's also lesser degrees of trust, um, all sorts of problems that come out of like partners on phones. That's something we can talk about some other time. Right. Um, want something else too, real quick, just boredom. There's a whole bunch of, tons of research on boredom and creativity and happiness and all these things. And Joseph Brodsky wrote about this a lot in the 70s and 80s, um, way before there was any um, idea of um, the smartphone, but essentially what it says and what he said was that boredom strongly correlated to happiness and to creativity. And the smartphone, from all intents and purposes, robs us of that creativity because it squashes boredom. It says to you and to your child, are you bored? Mm -hmm. Just use this thing. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good thing. Because boredom, even though it has a negative connotation, actually can be a really good thing. Creativity comes out of boredom. That's when you're forced to come up with your own ideas and do things and entertain yourself um, and try new things. The smartphone robs us of that. It says, you don't have to do that. Well, you're bored? You don't have to be bored. Look at this. Watch this thing. Play this game. Do a mindless candy crush or something. I don't know. But the point is, it's taking the place of boredom. Yeah, I know you. I know you like boredom. No, no, I disagree with that a little bit. Because I would say doing nothing. And doing that, doing nothing, you don't necessarily have to be bored. But doing nothing can lead to creativity. Twenty of two says doing nothing can lead to the best of something. <laughs> and people today quite often never have time to just do nothing. Yeah. And, and, and I think 
that's that's where we get our new ideas. It's actually when uh, you know, uh, you know, top level managers complain that you know they have time to do strategic thinking because the strategic thinking takes time, and, 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 but you got to you got to set aside time to do that. That, I think that's why you've seen an explosion recently with the rise of smartphone and popularity and usage. You've seen also a rise in like meditation and mindfulness apps and programs, which ironically you're doing on your smartphone. But <laughs> there, there's a real effort to counterbalance that. And the answer seems to be not just get off the phone, but do nothing. You know? And it's okay to do nothing. And our kids probably need to understand and know that it's okay to do nothing. Um, that's a whole, yeah. We, and we can skip to the cognitive stuff. I've got some questions, but we can talk about this later. The cognitive thing is the last one I want to talk about, and this is just the um, sort of neuro approach to what the smartphones are doing to us in terms of our long and short term memories, um, the way that we use search engines, the way that we lean on our devices for um, answers and solutions when really, in fact, they're just giving us information and content, which is not the same as answers. Um, I think this is really troubling for me. Like, I've heard our kids like try, you know, to ask Siri or some, or, I, or something like ask them a question. I've been like in another room and I hear like, um, Siri, what's the Spanish word for it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, I. It's not that I that you can't use it in productive ways. It's just that similarly to boredom, when you use the smartphone to answer all of your questions rather than letting it just sit and think and try and come up with the answer yourself. It's robbing you of what's called generative process. You don't get to generate your own information and knowledge in a way that smartphone just seems to have an answer at, at its ready, right? Um, this is called the degeneration effect. Um, there's also a whole bunch of other issues that come along with using search engines in our phones to answer our most basic questions. And sometimes if you hear kids talking to their phones, they're asking, they're seeking answers. They want to know like important questions. Like they want to ask these things, very personal, deep questions. And the problem with that is like, you know, what's very interesting, and you can do all sorts of exercises on this, but the algorithmic ex expression of Google is set up to reflect the syntax of what you type into the search engine box, text <coughs> box, right? So if you're asking it, for example, is there a God, you'll get these answers. Right? So these are God's existence and things. But if you ask it if there's no God, you effectively reinforce that point of view. So you, and you can do this with all sorts of things. There are, this was one of the more tamer examples that I could find, but there are some really, um, really nasty, um, really nasty examples of this. As, as it pretends to, like, racism, um, misogyny, um, as you can imagine, like the tech industry is dominated by a certain demographic. So like, you know, it's not just this, but the point is, our kids are using this thing as a magic eight ball, or like a genie that can tell them the answers to these things, when in fact it's not telling them answers, it's responding to their perspective that they're bringing to that already. So in a way, it's almost a mirror of something that's going to reinforce their perspective, rather than show them diverse perspectives or a more informed answer. Um, you know, you can ask Google whether the earth is flat or not. And depending on how you word it, you're going to get different answers. I don't think that's a great thing. So that's the danger in, in this. And I think, too, another um, way to think about this is like a philosophical exercise about the ship of Theseus, where it asks the person to think about if this is the original ship on top, and it requires some repairs, and it's asking you to um, replace a few planks on the ship, and you do so, is it still the ship of Theseus? Is it still the same ship? And you might say, well, yeah, yeah, we just replaced a few planks. But what if you replace the entire deck? Is it still the ship of Theseus? And you might still say, yeah, so, yeah. But if you replace every single piece of that ship with something modern, and it looks like the bio ship on the bottom, is that the ship of Theseus? And the answer is, no, that's not the same ship. But at what point does it stop becoming the original ship? And the reason I'm using that analogy is because 
if we are constantly leaning on our technologies for answers about who we are, like at what point do we stop becoming ourselves and become, sorry. <laughs> I know, it's not philosophy class, I know. But like, I'm just saying, like at what point do we stop becoming ourselves and start thinking for ourselves and turn into more of a reflection of what we're using our technology for? That's just a thing to give you nightmares. <laughs> Let's give me two slides, Pam. Let's go to the next one. And I, I asked you what rules you practice, and you have some pretty obvious ones. These are really good. If you're not doing these, I would suggest doing these. Um, if your kids have smartphones, setting um, boundaries and limits, times when they can do things. I like the idea too of having tech-free designated areas. So a lot of you already put like the dinner table, but like consider an entire room living room, or like in front of TV, like, um, which is called media multitasking, by the way, when you have a phone while you're watching TV. Um, Correct, yeah. Just saying, no phones in the living room, period. That's the rule. No phones at dinner table, no phones in the bedroom. That's it, right? Or specific times, um, you can have the contract, I really like that idea. Um, you know, I think these are really good things that you're already doing. I've got a rule that we kind of recently started with older kids on our street that our kids are used to hanging out with when they were little and now they're getting older and the older ones have phones and it's making our children feel left out because when they're there they're not socializing they're just looking at a phone so for example last night there were kids over wanting to watch basketball with the adults and we're like well you can't have your phone out so mm -hmm. you're welcome to come and hang but the phones are not coming out and they were cool, and they all ended up playing, and it worked out much better. So, and I get that they have to text their moms, but you need to let mom know to either walk down or text me. Don't you're not going to be on your phone because they're not texting mom; they're looking at social media or something else. Right. It's always under the guise of communication, but then ends up being something. Yeah. Like, oh, well, I need to let mom that will. And you can, down the street, you can be even more deliberate about it and have an actual little bin that you make that yeah. have your phone bin. I've seen that too all over. That's a good idea. Yeah, I mean you can you can have those types of things and not make it a confrontational kind of thing, like but just more like oh, just so you know, just like you know we don't wear um, shoes in the house. We also don't bring our phones in the house. Yeah. Whatever, you know. Um, so it's just it's your house, your rules. Yeah. That actually occurs in meetings. I mean, I've been to meetings. Washington DC where everybody has to leave their phone in the box outside. Yeah, in fact there's actually um, there's a cool company called Yonder, Y O N D R. If any of you want to really get like into this with your schools and like put forth initiatives and things, like there are some schools who are doing this already, but Yonder is a program that um, gives every student a pouch. It's like a little felt pouch. And a lot of the big um, uh, musicians and comedians now use this at their concerts. Dave Chappelle and Jack White, and uh, I, I mean, uh, there must be 15. Bruno Mars. Who? Bruno, Mars. Bruno Mars. A lot of them are doing this now. Where when you walk into the venue, they give you a pouch, your phone goes in the pouch, and then it locks magnetically. And there has someone with a hub who's in control of that magnetic lock. And so at some point, you can decide to just unlock the thing, and everyone's phones can be taken out. But for that time, while they're in the concert, there are no phones. And it also silences um, notifications and things on their phones. So like, it is a truly phone-free experience. Some schools are starting to do this now. Um, but I think people are realizing that sometimes it's going to have to take actual, like, you're going to have to take action. To, you can't just ask people, you know, Hey, don't talk on your phone in the movie theater. Like at some point, you're probably going to have to drop your phone in a pouch when you go into a movie theater or something. So, um, oh yeah, okay. Is there one slide before this? Can you go back one? Back one. Back one. Maybe. Yeah. Can you go back one? <laughs> That's all right. Oh. Oh, maybe not. Okay. That's fine. We'll do that. Go back. There you go. Yeah, so what can you do? Okay, so these are some strategies you can do right this minute um, if your kid has a smartphone. 
Uh, I think it's also important to track their usage. I don't mean you track it, I mean have them track their usage. Be aware of what you're doing. I think a lot of people would be surprised to know how much time they're spending on their phones. Be bored, it's okay. You don't have to be doing something at all times. It's okay to be bored. Uh, whenever it's possible, I always try to favor print over digital. Whenever possible. Uh, that's just, I mean, I know we're being pushed towards digital and it's just more convenient and easier, but, you know, Anytime you can take print, you take print. No notifications, have designated tech-free zones and times, boundaries. I think probably one of the most important things we can do is model the behaviors that we want to see our kids exhibit. That's what, that's what parenting is. That's where they're going to learn it. They're going to see you doing it. And it doesn't matter what we say. It matters what we do in front of them. Um, I think just the simple things like reading with the kid, I mean, I have, with each of our older kids, I have a book that we're reading um, together just at all times that we just are reading so that we can read and talk about so that when they want to sit down, like in the morning for breakfast when they're eating, rather than hop on a device, they can just pull out their book and read sometimes if they feel like they have to do something, which they'll do that, um, or in the car, or whatever. Um, take breaks. I like the idea of forming this coalition with people it doesn't always work, but I think it really incentivizes other parents. Because if you feel like you're on an island on your own, and you're the only ones doing this, you're going to fall eventually. You're going to give in. But if it's a group of you, and you're saying, you know what, let's stick together. Let's have a united front. Let's really try to stick together on this. And let's say eighth grade, or seventh grade, or whatever you decide it is. Stick together and use each other in those ways. Oh, and the earning screen time thing. There's, um, this check, I made this uh, laminated checklist. It's at the door if you want to take one on your way out. But um, we use this at our house where you, they have to earn their screen time. If they want to use an iPad or get on their phone or whatever, you know what, it's fine sometimes. But have you done all these other things first? Mm -hmm. And you can modify this. this. This isn't like set in stone or anything. And I left some lines open for you to write on them. Just use a dry erase marker. But it's just basic things like, is your, did you do all your school, school work today? Um, is stuff tidied up upstairs in your room? Move your body for 10 minutes. And then I put in there to create something and to help someone. And those things can be super minor things. But it just forces them to stop. And just instead of coming home and reaching for a device and plugging in, they stop for a second and say, OK, I've got to like, go create something. And it, sometimes it's something stupid. But like, you did it and it forced you to stop. And honestly, by the time that they've done three or four of these things, they don't even want to get on the device anymore. And, and that's probably the biggest finding that I've seen with using that, is when you, they just kind of mindlessly grab for devices sometimes. But if you make them stop and think and do other things first, it often like distracts them and they, they go off course and they're like, I'm just gonna do this instead. Or they get sucked into whatever, Legos or some other thing and they've totally forgotten about the screen time. So that's something that might come in handy if you want to use that. And then the last thing I have is... Um, a question while you're on that one. Yeah. Um, so for something like that, would you do this daily? Anytime they ask for a screen. And would you do it, like, how long for an elementary age child? Like, what grade? Um, so we're first, second, and third grade. Because I, I guarantee they're going to do this, and they're going to get wrapped up in, let's just say, playing Legos. And it's going to be bedtime, and then they're going to be like, you promised, right. Mom, I did everything right. on here, and now it's bedtime, and you promised. And promise. that will absolutely <laughs> happen at first. That will absolutely happen. They will do that. Um, and then that's when you just have to be like, you just didn't get through the list, you know? Or it's just it's bedtime. Yeah. But it, they'll learn. Like, our my 10-year-old, he knows, like, now. He's like, oh, uh, create something? Um, here's a nice little note for my brother. Take some 10 seconds. Oh, help somebody? I'm going to, you know put these dishes away. Like, he knows how to be super efficient about things, but but he's sort of, like, he's sort of broken this, this checklist a little bit, so i got to come up with some harder tasks, but, yeah. Um, oh, this, this thing. Here's another thing you can ask yourself about if you're deciding or on the fence about giving your kids phones. There are a whole bunch of checklists and resources online that you can use, that you can actually complete, and it'll tell you if your kid's ready. But it asks some really interesting questions. Um, it's the Academy of um, P 
Pediatrics has some questions you can answer, and I've picked out a couple of these different things that I think are especially important, like social skills. Um, uh, I think it's important that they have these things established before we jump into the digital. And as I kept saying earlier, it's different for everybody. If your kid exhibits these things and has wonderful social skills, has demonstrated that she or he can think critically and understands dangerous relationships and situations and things, maybe they're ready. Maybe they're in fifth grade, but maybe they're ready. You know? Like, does that mean you give them the device and say, have fun? No. But there's no magic age, just as they all sort of develop at different rates. So that's another one. And then the last one I want to show you, um, Pam, you can go to either one farther. Oh, never mind, that's good. Yeah. Dumb, yeah, the dumb phone. That's also, like, this has come so far just the, in the last, like, three years with the options and the phones now that look like real phones, so they're not, like, embarrassed to carry these phones. They used to be super childish and, like, like fun bright colors and now it's like they look like real phones um, but they're designed specifically for limited use and for younger kids so it allows for you to communicate with them it allows for them to be able to do basic tasks on their devices but it limits them it excludes them from really dangerous activities and you have total control over it so if you're interested in like letting them kind of get a little taste of things um, True Me is a good one. Bark. Someone in here, or someone on the survey said they had a Bark phone. Um, I really like the Bark phone. And then Gab has a watch and the phone now. Um, B-A-R-K. B-A-R-K. B -A -R -K. Bark. Bark. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good phone. Um, and then, of course, there's also just the Apple Watch. You can use an Apple Watch to limit everything on the watch and say who the person can and can't contact and talk to and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, oh, hopefully these are some good solutions, but I mean, like I said in the very beginning, this is not, I don't have, I don't have all the answers, I don't have all the answers, definitely, and I've definitely made mistakes, and I can't even stand here and tell you like the way, the way that I'm doing it is the best way to do it, I don't, I don't know, this is, you know, um, we're just kind of doing it trial, trial and error, so, um, but I can tell you that I don't regret waiting, and I, I don't regret um, being super thoughtful about how we approach phones and technology in our house. Um, I don't regret that one bit, but I can tell you I do know plenty of people who tell me that they regret going all in immediately. You know, I'm not. That, I'm not saying like get their kid a phone. I'm just saying like the ones who gave their kids phones and just were like. There you go, have fun. They're the ones who typically will tell me that they regret it and they want to know how do we get back. And I'm like, mm, you're not really getting back from that. Good luck telling them that they, they're going to have to delete their TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram accounts. So that would be my last piece of advice to you is like, go incrementally. You know, take your time. They've got the rest of their lives to be digital citizens. So, anyways, I don't want to take up any more time, but I'm happy to keep talking to people if you want to talk. So, thank you very much. Thank you.